In the work that we've done so far, we've been receiving and sending messages, and we've sort of been just operating under the model that the messages somehow appear and they somehow get sent. We know somewhere in the picture there's this thing called the file adapter, but we haven't really talked about it a whole lot. This would be a good time to stop and take a closer look at what BizTalk adapters actually do, and then expand our knowledge of how we can work with them, and then also get a better understanding of what BizTalk provides in terms of adapters. So let's get started. So as always, we'll start off with a conceptual level view of what BizTalk adapters are. And included in that, we should be able to get a better sense of what kind of options are available to us when we're working with BizTalk adapters. And then after that, we'll walk through some of the practical details of working with adapters. And we'll take a look at what it takes to configure some of these. BizTalk Server 2010 includes quite a long list of adapters, so I'll tell you about those. And then at the end of this module, I will demonstrate the SharePoint adapter. And you'll be able to see how you can use the SharePoint adapter to publish to a SharePoint document library and read from a SharePoint document library. We'll start off this lesson by taking a closer look at what exactly a BizTalk adapter is and the role that it plays in BizTalk, and also how it goes about doing its work. And as I mentioned, BizTalk ships with a number of adapters. But if you can't find the adapter that you need in the box, you have a few other options available to you, and I'll talk about that as well. One of the options you have in that, by the way, is that you can create custom adapters, and there is a BizTalk adapter framework that can help you get started with that. I'm not going to pretend that's a simple task, but if a custom adapter is the best way to meet the needs of your application, then at least the BizTalk adapter framework can give you a head start. All right, so what exactly is an adapter, and how do they work? Well, an adapter is a component that is simply responsible for sending or receiving messages over a particular protocol. And the design goal there is that by limiting adapters to simply sending and receiving messages, and by factoring any message processing capabilities out into pipeline components, that there's greater potential for reusing those pipeline components. After all, if we create an adapter that communicates over some proprietary protocol, and then also does some sort of XML processing, so who's to say? that those messages might not arrive by some other protocol down the road. Or maybe even a system administrator finds that it would be convenient to be able to accept some of those messages by the file system if they need to be resubmitted for any reason. Well, in that case, if we've factored out the XML processing into a separate pipeline component, we can simply create a new receive location, conf configure it with the file adapter, and then add our pipeline that contains our custom XML processing, and now we can be receiving over both protocols in parallel. So an adapter then might implement the details of communicating over some particular network protocol, or it might implement the details required to communicate with a particular application. And in that case, it is probably calling application APIs. So adapters are implemented either as .NET or COM components. BizStock's underlying messaging engine has actually been implemented as a collection of COM components. So an adapter really consists of three parts. There is a design time component and two runtime components. The runtime components implement the details of sending and receiving the messages. And then the design time component is the thing that you see in the BizTalk administration console. And that's the window that pops up that allows you to enter configuration settings. On the receive side, it is actually the receive adapter that creates the message object that is going to be published into the message box. And along with that, the adapter is responsible for initializing the message context. So when you look at the details of a message in the BizTalk administration console, you'll see a number of properties that were set by the adapter. The adapter will report the URL at which the message was received. The file adapter will report the original file name of the message. It will report the date and time that the message was received and so forth. And it's good that it does that because that information can be very helpful when you're trying to diagnose certain problems. Now, once that receive adapter has a reference to a message object, it is going to call the message engine to submit that message to the message box. If it's configured to perform one-way receives, and that's all some adapt receive adapters are capable of, it will simply submit the message to the message box and then wait to hear back that everything processed successfully. And then it will commit that message. Receive adapters are actually going to write messages to the message box in batches. And it's going to do that for the sake of efficiency. After all, it's going to use a transaction to write a message to the message box. And by writing messages in a batch, it can divide the performance cost over many messages. It will be able to reduce the number of round trips that it needs to make to the database. 
Now, if the receive adapter is in a request response receive location, then it will send the message to the message box and commit. And it will register a callback because it needs to receive a response from some other component within BizTalk. It might be waiting for an orchestration, for example, to generate a response. Once it gets the response via that callback, it's going to send that message out. Now, if the adapter receives news back that one of the message failed processing somewhere en route to the message box, it could have been a pipeline component complained, or it could be that something failed in a map. In that case, the receive adapter has to decide what to do. Depending on the adapter, it might roll back the entire transaction, or it might issue a call to the messaging engine to suspend that particular message. So once that's done, it's the job of the receive adapter to clean things up. So in the case of the file adapter, it's going to go out and delete the files from the file system so they don't get read in again. Or it might need to send some sort of a status back to the system that submitted the messages. So on the send side, the roles are reversed. It's the messaging agent that's responsible for creating the message objects, and it has to ask the send adapter for a batch. So then it can submit those messages into that batch. So then once the send port receives its messages, it's going to attempt to send those out. So if the send adapter is able to successfully send all of the messages, it notifies the messaging engine, and that batch is closed. Otherwise, it needs to report which messages failed. So in that case, the send adapter is going to issue a resubmit call to the messaging engine, in which case those messages will remain in the message box. And after the configured retry period for that send port, the adapter will receive those messages again to try once more. And if it repeats that cycle and exhausts the retry count, it will then tell the message agent that it's switching over to its backup transport, and it will go through that sequence again. And so during the duration of all this, these messages are not considered suspended. So if you don't see the message show up where you expect, and you don't see it suspended, keep in mind that the send port could be iterating through its retry counts. The default for the file adapter is three retries over five minutes, so you could be waiting a while. For testing purposes, you might find that it's more convenient to set the retry count and retry period to zero. If the send adapter then also fails to send the message on its backup transport, then it will finally issue a call to the messaging engine to suspend that message. When everything goes successfully, the send adapter will actually issue a call to delete the message from the message box. In a request response send port, however, the send adapter is also responsible for accepting the response message back and submitting that to the message box as well. So from the perspective of the BizTalk messaging engine, an adapter is just this component that calls back and forth for these messages. So it really doesn't care what the component is actually doing, it just needs to be able to handle these calls. And so that's what makes it possible to plug in new adapters and swap out old ones. One other aspect of adapters is the way in which they are hosted. Most adapters are hosted in process, that is, in the BizTalk service process. Some adapters, however, such as the HTTP receive adapter, those actually run in an IIS process. So you'll hear those referred to as isolated adapters. So BizTalk doesn't really have any control over the lifetime of that adapter, whether it remains in memory or not. So all it can do is decide whether it's going to accept messages or reject messages from that adapter. And so for that reason, it can be a little more complex working with those adapters. Not only do you have BizTalk configuration settings that you need to deal with, you need to make sure that you have your IIS configuration settings correct as well. When you're trying to find adapters that meet the needs of your applications, you have a few places to look. First of all, there are quite a few adapters that are included in with a BizTalk license. Some of them are installed automatically with BizTalk. Some of them are separate installs. And in some cases, you might even have to do a separate download from the Microsoft website to get some of those adapters. So you can also search the web and you'll find third-party adapters available. But if you just can't find an adapter that meets your application requirements, it is possible to write a custom adapter. Now, if you do find that you need to create a custom adapter, BizTalk provides an adapter framework to help you get a head start. If you just need some sort of special message processing, I think it's safe to say that you'll find that it's far easier to implement a pipeline component than it is to implement a custom adapter. But there are certainly legitimate needs for custom adapters. So if you ultimately determine that it makes sense to take the root of a custom adapter, then you'll need to write the three components. You'll need to write the design time component that displays the user interface in the administration console and then performs validation on input of configuration settings. And you'll need to implement the receive side component and you'll need to implement the send side component. 
By the way, there's nothing that says you have to implement both send and receive. You only need to implement the communication direction that you need for your app. You can get an idea of what's involved if you take a look at the BizTalk SDK. That contains a sample custom file adapter. So you can take a look at that to get started. And then the BizTalk adapter framework provides additional samples. And then the framework documentation provides sample code throughout. So, so you have something to go by. So when you finish coding your adapter, you'll need to register it with BizTalk. And then BizTalk will treat it like any other adapter. BizTalk will create an instance of your adapter when it starts. And it will pass your adapter its configuration settings. And it will process whatever calls you make to the messaging agent. And then if BizTalk is shutting down, it will notify your adapter that it's doing so. Just keep in mind that with BizTalk's hosting model, it's possible that you could have multiple instances of your custom adapter running. And if you design accordingly, you can take advantage of that. Otherwise, you'll just need to be careful in the way that you deploy the adapter. One last item to note is that there is another adapter SDK, and that is called the WCF Line of Business Adapter SDK. And that's different than the SDK that we're talking about here. The SDK that we're talking about here, the BizTalk Adapter Framework, is what you would use to write a new adapter from the ground up. The WCF Line of Business SDK, on the other hand, is what you could use if you're communicating with a system that exposes web services. And that SDK helps you plug WCF components together to implement those web service communications, whether you're receiving web service calls or issuing web service calls. So you'll want to include that in your list of options as well. So now that you have some background in what an adapter is and what they do for us, let's focus in on the adapters that come in the box with BizTalk Server 2010. So I'll just start off by talking about adapter configuration in general and what you can expect to encounter. And then we'll spend a little bit of time looking at the protocol adapters that come in the box with BizTalk. So these are the adapters that speak some particular network protocol. So they're more or less the low level adapters. And I'll show you how to set one of those up. We're also going to spend a minute talking about the improvements that have been made to the FTP adapter in BizTalk Server 2010. After that, I'll introduce the WCF adapters to you. And there are actually two modules later on in which we're going to look at those in detail. There's one module dedicated to the receive side and one module dedicated to the send side. So at this point, I'll just provide an overview of what the WCF adapters look like. And then finally, we'll take a look at the list of application adapters that come with BizTalk Server 2010. And amongst those is the SharePoint adapter. So we'll make use of that to read and write to a SharePoint site. And I'll show you how to do that in a demo. So the receive locations property dialog box should look familiar to you by now. And so that means you have some experience already configuring an adapter. We've been using the file adapter pretty regularly. And the file adapter properties are self-explanatory for the most part. So we've been configuring the file adapter to read from our local file system. And then we've been taking advantage of the file mask. Some people ask about the file mask, if we can configure that to accept multiple extensions. And the answer there is, is that you would need to create a receive location for each of the file extensions. And that's generally what you want, because those extensions indicate that each receive location should process that file somewhat differently. We've been leaving the public address blank, and that's really just there for documentation purposes. That's where you could put the path that an external partner or system would need to use to access this location in the file system. If you click on the batching tab, you'll find that the default batch size is 20. And that's something you'll probably just want to leave alone. If you're dealing with large files, and if the adapter is trying to process 20 of those at a time, that might consume a lot of resources, so you might think about reducing the batch size. And the reverse being true then for small files. But that totally depends on the type of adapter that you're using. Now, when you go to configure an adapter that implements a different protocol, you'll be presented with a completely different collection of properties. So each adapter will present its own user interface. And that's the purpose of the design time component of an adapter to be able to collect and validate the settings that apply to its particular protocol. As you're configuring an adapter, you'll need to be familiar with the protocol that it implements. And for some adapters, they present so many options, you might need a better than average knowledge of the protocol. So here's a list of the fundamental adapters that come with BizTalk. Each of these implements a particular communication protocol. You have both receive and send capability. Of course, in the case of the email, POP3 implements the receive, SMTP implements the send. The other adapters implement both sides of the communication. Speaking in terms of the receive side, some of these adapters will go out and poll. You can configure the FTP adapter, for example, to monitor a particular FTP location. 
And it will go out and poll to see if any data has shown up in that location. And you can configure the polling interval within the FTP adapter properties. On the other hand, the HTTP adapter is hosted in IIS and it simply listens and waits for messages to arrive. And as soon as it receives one, it will publish that into the message box. You might hear me talk about ordered delivery at some point during a demonstration. And if you need BizTalk to receive messages in a certain order, you'll need to make use of an adapter that supports order delivery. So in this case, that would be something like the MSMQ or the MQ series adapter. But otherwise, you need to operate under the assumption that messages can arrive in any order in the message box. Order delivery, of course, really slows things down. This list includes the SOAP adapter, and it's really being included there for backward compatibility. If you're doing any new application development, you would want to make use of the WCF adapters that you're going to see a little later on. The POP3 and SMTP adapters have been improved over time. So while they might not implement all of the security features, you might need to contact external email servers. They're certainly useful if you're contacting an email system on your internal network. And they're particularly useful if you need to accommodate human interaction. The BizTalk FTP adapter has always been a popular option for dealing with communication in integration scenarios. But it had some limitations that precluded it from being adopted in many applications. But those have been addressed now in BizTalk Server 2010. And one of the major items is that it now includes support for secure FTP. So you'll find some new properties when you're configuring the FTP adapter. And those apply specifically to SSL and TLS connections. You'll find those properties available both on the receive side and the send side. And so now you might be able to take advantage of the option that you no longer have to communicate internally or over a VPN to connect to a FTP site. Another limitation of the earlier FTP adapter is that it could not handle downloads from read-only locations. And that was because it would be implemented under the assumption that it would delete each file as it read it. So if it ever tried to read from a read-only location, the delete would fail. And the next time it contacted the, that location, it would find the same file and read it in again. But now in BizTalk Server 2010, you can configure the FTP receive adapter to handle a read-only location. And if you do that, it will maintain a list of files that it has downloaded. And when it establishes a connection, it will compare the contents of the FTP folder with the list of files that is previously downloaded. And it will only download the new ones. Now, by default, it will only look for new file names, but you can also enable it to scan for updates to file timestamps. So with that enabled, the FTP adapter can detect updates to existing files, and it will download those updates as well. One other improvement that has been made is that the FTP adapter now supports atomic transfers in ASCII mode. And so what that means is that the adapter will upload a file to a temporary location on the FTP server, and only when the upload has completed will it move the file on the FTP server. So that means you'll need to include that temporary file location in the configuration settings. Now, when the FTP adapter is in binary mode, it takes advantage of the fact that it's uploading to that temporary folder and it supports resuming transfers that have failed. But that feature, however, is not implemented for ASCII mode. In this demonstration, I'll show you how to configure the FTP receive adapter to pull an FTP location and download any files that it finds there. All right, we're back in the BizTalk administration console, and we need to add a new receive port to the demos application to accept shipment messages. We're going to accept these messages with the FTP receive adapter, so we'll set it up as a one-way receive port. OK, now we need to add the receive location. And this will be our shipment's FTP receive location. And now we'll select the FTP adapter from this list. And then we need to configure the FTP properties. We'll be downloading files from the Shipped Orders folder of our FTP server. And those files will have the .xml extension. Now let's provide a password to log in.
and the server will be our local machine. And then we'll enter our username. Now these messages will eventually be processed by an orchestration. And in order for that to work, we'll need to select the XML receive pipeline. And I'll talk more about the reason behind that in the next module. Okay, so there we have it. We've set up a receive location that is going to pull an FTP server to see if any new shipment messages have shown up. So the protocol adapters are very good if you need to establish basic communication with another system. If you're integrating with a system that presents a web service interface, you probably want to think about the WCF adapters. So this is a series of adapters that is built on top of Windows Communication Foundation. So consequently, the WCF adapters have a lot in common at their core. Now what the WCF adapters are doing is giving you a way to choose amongst various WCF bindings. Now, if you're not familiar with Windows Communication Foundation, bindings is going to be a new term. You'll be wondering what WCF bindings are. Well, the short answer to that question is that a WCF binding is a list of components that you want to work together to process a WCF call. So when you're configuring one of the built-in WCF adapters, you're just seeing configuration options for a particular grouping of WCF components. So if you're going to communicate with a service over MSMQ, you could use the WCF Net MSMQ adapter, and you would be presented with a property page in which you would enter the URL of that service, and then you could visit the bindings tab, which has all the particulars of the MSMQ connection, and then you could visit the messages tab, which is common to all of the WCF adapters, and this is where you can decide exactly how the content of your message should be delivered. So for now, the main idea is that the WCF adapters provide a way to interact with web services, and they share a common architecture. And ultimately, that gives you a lot of flexibility if you need to implement extra features. This talk has provided a SQL adapter for quite some time, but that's actually being superseded now by the WCF adapters. You'll find that it's still included in the installation, but it's really just there for backward compatibility. So this is another one of those cases where you'll want to be thinking of using the WCF adapter for new development. Now I'm going to do something similar to what you might have done with a SQL adapter in the past. So I'm going to connect to a SQL Server database and I am going to download some metadata that will provide my application with what it needs to communicate with SQL Server. So in this case, when Visual Studio downloads the metadata, it is going to generate a custom WCF binding. And so we'll be able to use that to configure a WCF adapter in a port so that it can communicate with SQL Server. A little further down the road, our application will need to connect to SQL Server to insert new rows into the AdventureWorks loans table. We don't have any schemas that define the format of those insert messages. So we're going to let Visual Studio help us generate those schemas. So I'll start by adding a new item to this project. And specifically, this will be a generated item. Visual Studio is going to read the metadata from SQL Server and generate the schemas for us. So we want to consume an adapter service. And now Visual Studio is going to help us configure a WCF binding for this adapter. And so now we can choose among these pre-configured WCF bindings. Now we need to provide a URL for that connection. So we can select our security type. And then we can enter the information required to connect to the AdventureWorks database. Okay, now we need to connect to the AdventureWorks database 
And then the user interface will be populated with a collection of objects that we might want to use. So that will include table names, view names, stored procedures, and so forth. So we will be using this adapter to insert new rows into the loans table. So let's find the loans table. All right, now we can select the operations that are required for our application. In this case, we only need to insert loans. Okay, we're almost ready to generate the files, but before we do so, I'd like to identify those files with a prefix. So let's enter that. Okay, so you can see that we have a few new schemas that have been added to our project. Let's take a look at the schema that defines the message format that is required to insert a loan. Okay, there you see the format of the insert message. It allows us to insert multiple loans. And then you can also see the format of the response message. And it can return multiple results. OK, well, let's build and deploy this project. All right, the deployment succeeded. Now, since this assembly had already been loaded by our host instance, and we have not changed the version number, we need to restart the host instance to pick up these changes. Okay, we're going to leave this here, and then when we start working with orchestrations, will eventually make use of this metadata. With adapters being the powerful things that they are, each adapter presents a lot of potential for new integration scenarios. So to state the obvious, the more adapters that we have access to, the better. And fortunately, in BizTalk Server 2010, that list of options is long. So I won't read this list to you, but just by looking at it, you can see that BizTalk can interact with the major players in enterprise systems. If you visit the BizTalk product page, at Microsoft.com, you'll be able to find a detailed list of the applications and versions that these adapters support. So if you consider the range of this list included with the protocol adapters and the capabilities of the WCF adapters, and then on top of that, the option of third-party and custom adapters, it's hard to think of a system that BizTalk would not be able to connect with. You'd have to say that BizTalk seems to have the bases pretty well covered. You can begin to get a sense of the wide range of the capabilities that BizTalk adapters offer. So to some degree, the application adapters are going to look familiar. Like all of the others, they will present a set of properties that you can configure. And just like the protocol adapters, you will need to be familiar with the application that the adapter is contacting. And you'll need a better than average understanding of how that application communicates. So while it might take a little while to understand how to use and configure a particular application adapter, it's nice to think that you don't have to write the code to make all that happen. Since SharePoint has been installed in the virtual machines for this course, I will be able to show you how to use that application adapter. I'll show you how to configure the SharePoint receive adapter to read a document out of a document library. And I'll show you how to configure the SharePoint send adapter to send documents to a new document library. All right, we're back in the admin console. And our first task is to set up a receive port and receive location to accept loans from SharePoint. Okay, so this will be our loan application SharePoint receive port. 
And now we'll select the SharePoint adapter. And eventually our application will process these with an orchestration. So we'll configure this with the XML receive pipeline. And now let's set the properties for the connection to the SharePoint server. So we'll be reading these from the Loan Applications document library. And that library has a view named Evaluated. So each of the loan applications has a loan status that defaults to pending. This Evaluated view will only present loan applications that have a status other than pending. And those are the ones that we want our application to download and process. Okay, let's enable that receive location now, and it's ready to accept messages. Now, once our receive location reads in one of those documents, it is going to delete that from the loan applications document library. So we have another document library called process loans that keeps a record of all of these loan applications. And so let's create a send port to send these process loan applications to that new document library. And again, we'll select the SharePoint adapter. And so we'll send these to the Process Loans document library. And when those messages are uploaded, we want to uniquely identify each of those messages with their message ID value. And this document library resides on our local machine. And now, since our orchestration hasn't been created yet, let's set up a subscription filter to accept all messages that come in through our loan application receive port. Now let's start the send port. And now, before we test this, let's make sure that all of the BizTalk services have been started on our machine. And now let's go take a look at the Loan Applications document library. Okay, you can see that we have three loan applications. Let's approve this loan application and see if our receive location picks it up. So here's our InfoPath form. Let's change the status and submit it back to the document library. OK, let's refresh our document library. And over to the right, you can see that the status on our loan has changed to Approved. And if we click Refresh, we should eventually see that loan disappear. OK, it's gone. It's been picked up by our Receive location. Now we should be able to go look at the Process Loans document library and see it show up there. OK, there you have it. You saw what it takes to set up a Receive location to read messages from a document library. And then you saw what it takes to set up a Send port to send messages to a SharePoint document library. In this lab, you're going to start off by publishing an InfoPath form to a SharePoint library. So the data is in XML format underneath. It will open within an InfoPath form, which will provide a nice user interface that you can use to read and update the document. Once that's set up, you'll have a chance to configure the HTTP and FTP adapters. And then finally, you'll end this lab by configuring the SharePoint adapter to send messages to the SharePoint library.